show up. When Roland Emmerich's 1998 Godzilla film premiered, expectations were high. A major Hollywood studio was taking a crack at the legendary King of Monsters, and technology had advanced enough that a big special effects budget could bring the God of Destruction to life in an unprecedented way. Alright, maybe it looks cheesy now, given how far CGI has come in the last 22 years, but I mean, come on, we were still using floppy disks in 1998. Jesus Christ. Now, the fact that the movie was also helmed by Emmerich contributed a lot to the hype. He was fresh off of Independence Day, one of the biggest and most beloved blockbusters of the 90s. Welcome to Earth. Come to think of it, I'm surprised they never made a TV show out of that. That's what I call a close encounter. Anywho, Godzilla came out, and I'm going to keep it real with y'all, the movie was not exactly loved. I don't know what's wrong. Lots of fans, me included, felt the story was kind of lame, and also that the monster in the movie wasn't really true to the function and spirit of classic Godzilla. The movie made some decent money at the box office, but the fan and critical response was so bleak that the studio canceled the two planned sequels. Guess they figured they quit while they were ahead. Toho, the Japanese studio that produced the OG Godzillas and licensed the rights to Sony, would later effectively disown the movie. But hey, whatever you think of it, at least the movie brought us this classic song. I love you daily and not sincerely, but you annoy me. You can't afford me. I'm here to stay. By the way, if you're keeping score at home, he was still going by Puff Daddy in 98. At the same time, there was a twist that definitely made it all worth it. Developed in conjunction with the 1998 film was a kid's cartoon, Godzilla the series. And this one turned out great. <laughs> Using the design of the monsters and carrying over a few characters over from the film, mostly in name. Joining us live is Dr. Nico Totopoulos. Look, Matthew Broderick looks nothing like his cartoon counterpart at all. Wrong floor. The series is super fun, features tons of cool monsters, and provides a great on-ramp to the world of kaiju fandom. Here's everything you didn't know about Godzilla the series. Before we jump into the nitty gritty of Godzilla the series, it's important that we acknowledge that this wasn't the first animated take on the King of Monsters. Godzilla, Godzilla. Classic, yes. Now, that 1978 Godzilla cartoon was a little bit more cartoonish, but hey, it's Hanna-Barbera and it's what they do. <laughs> Godzilla the series was a co-production among Columbia TriStar Television, which is a division of Sony, Toho, and Centropolis, which is Roland Emmerich's company. The show ran on Fox Kids from September 12, 1998 to April 22, 2000. There were two seasons with a total of 40 episodes, although only 38 of those episodes aired in the original run. Narratively, the show picks up right where the movie ends. Dr. Nick Totopoulos has helped stop Godzilla's rampage through New York, and it's cleanup time. I suggest we get back to Penn Station right now. If we miss just one of those eggs, we're gonna be battling for our very existence. That is, until a Godzilla egg hatches right in front of Nick, <gasps> gives him a lick, <sighs> and then just dips. Long story short, Nick wants to study the creature and comes to have a sort of parent-like relationship to the new Godzilla, while the military wants to blow up Lilzilla and, of course, Mayhem is Pretty soon, Nick is chasing monsters around the world with his team Heat. You heard of Heat? Which stands for Humanitarian Environmental Analysis Team. And 99% of the time, Godzilla is crashing the party every time. To Anchorman reference. That doesn't make sense. Nick's team is made up of Randy Hernandez, a wisecracking tech whiz. Oh man, I am good. Mendo Craven, a cowardly but good-hearted scientist. The Navy's got a tracking system that can find a nickel on the floor of the Atlantic. I should know. I helped design it. Elsie Chapman, a paleontologist and behavioral expert. What's the matter, news twinkie? Can't handle a little competition. Monique Dupré, a French special agent. Monique Dupré. I believe you know my associates in the insurance game. And Nigel, a robot. Next millennium, intelligence gathering electronic liaison. Because you need a robot. Wouldn't that be Nigel? <sighs> Nick, Elsie, and Mendel are all carryovers from the film. Additional characters of note to appear in both the movie and the film are Audrey Timmons, a journalist and quasi-love interest for Nick. Anybody home? Her cameraman, Animal Pilati. 
Just a little B-roll for the five o'clock. Colonel Hicks, who's major on the show, so maybe he got demoted? The armed forces can take it from here, worm guy. And Philippe Rocher. This decision does not concern them. The show features a lot of the cool things you might expect from a monster show. Evil scientists with goatees, visits to Area 51, literal aliens, and a healthy amount of science gibberish. Sounds like the tar is part of some kind of pre-digestive process? Yeah, we're thinking external stomach. But most important, of course, are the monsters themselves. Let's start with Godzilla. Some of us complain about the way Godzilla was represented in the 98 film. There, Godzilla had what filmmakers called power breath instead of the classic atomic breath that starts at his tail, goes up his back, and boom. Godzilla also wasn't very damage resistant in the movie. She was more of a giant lizard than God. The show Godzilla switched back to the classic abilities. Back came the atomic breath, and Godzilla was now super hard to kill again. My favorite thing about Godzilla the series, though, is that almost every episode featured a dope new monster. The creativity here is seriously off the charts, as these monsters just kept coming. What is it, Godzilla? You're the paleontologist, you tell me. Unfortunately, the series didn't contain any of Godzilla's classic monster rivals like Mothra or Ghidorah. But this wasn't an accident. Reportedly, the rights of those characters had to be negotiated separately, and getting approvals from Toho on each monster's use in the show would have been too time consuming for the show's production schedule. At the same time, this also gave the show the opportunity to design new monsters that were inspired by some of the classics, like Skidora. Think Mothra, but a mosquito and also much meaner. Skidora was not only absorbing the various mutations' powers, but combining them in new and destructive ways. Or Cyber Godzilla, a resurrected bionic version of the dead Godzilla from the film and who is reminiscent of Mecha Godzilla. <laughs> then there's the horned lizard monster in Area 51, which seems very influenced by Angiris. Oh, and the goopy trash eating micro colony monster from the episode Talking Trash feels like a fun riff on one of my favorite classic kaiju. Hedora. Hedora is made of pollution, and this monster is an out of control pollutant cleaner. There are many more, but we don't have time to list them all. Make sure to shout out your faves in the comments, though. We do want to shout out a specific reference not just to a classic character, but to a classic Godzilla film in the series. The episode Scale features Monster Island, which harkens back to the particularly beloved 1968 Toho film Destroy All Monsters, which featured all 11 monsters that had been created for the series up to that point. If you haven't seen that classic, I highly recommend it. Shout out to my boy Billy who put me onto that movie when we were kids. Listen to the monsters and their cries of horror and sudden death. And while it's not a reference to a Godzilla film, the episode Trust No One features a monster and a plot that's definitely inspired by John Carpenter's 1982 film, The Thing. But my personal favorite story about Godzilla the series has to be this. As you may remember, the 98 film featured crossover commercials with Taco Bell, starring, of course, the Taco Bell Chihuahua. Lizard, lizard, lizard. Yeah, you remember that. I think I need a bigger box. These commercials were kind of a hit, maybe more than the film itself, and the network wanted to capitalize on that. So, reportedly, at least one exec asked the writers to work the Taco Bell Chihuahua into Godzilla the series as a character. Can't imagine how that would have worked. Like, would he have fed Godzilla gorditas? Anyway, it's hard to imagine Toho getting on board with that kind of <clears throat> collaboration with their star IP. The network ultimately backed off on the idea, but damn, that's pretty funny to imagine. I'd like to see it. Godzilla the series' intro borrows heavily from the images of the movie. Most significantly, Godzilla hitting up some NYC landmarks. Once it reminds you of the movie, the intro kicks into show gear. We've got the Heat team getting out there, and of course, we've got some kick-ass fighting between Godzilla and the monsters. But the coolest thing about the intro, in my opinion, is the music. It almost sounds too epic for a cartoon. The big brass crescendo, it feels like it's out of a blockbuster. Although, I wouldn't have been mad if Puffy contributed music to the cartoon too. Just saying, Puffy 
the man made hits in the 90s. Uh-huh, yeah. It's all about the Benjamins, baby. Uh. The credit for the intro goes to Jim Latham. He did the music for a bunch of other Sony animated projects, some of which we've covered. Jackie Chan Adventures, <laughs> Men in Black the series, <laughs> and also Extreme Ghostbusters. <laughs> So it's also cool that these shows share not only some visual and narrative creators, as we'll detail soon, but musical ones too. There's something you have to see. As we said before, Godzilla the series was developed in conjunction with the film, and as a result, the production process was a lot more secretive than we typically get for a kid's cartoon. The design of the monster, which overlapped the movie and the show, was being kept hidden from the public to generate hype for the premiere. So everyone working on this show was sworn to contract and for secrecy. While the first season was being put together, they didn't even call the project Godzilla. Original documents referred to it as Heat Seekers and the monster as Gorgon or Thingy, which is weird, funny, kind of dope at the same time. <laughs> the series was developed by EP's Richard Reynas and Jeff Klein. Klein was also a top creative on Extreme Ghostbusters, Jackie Chan Adventures, and Men in Black the series. Reynas also worked on those three shows and is also known for being a producer on The Simpsons, no, no. King of the Hill, <gasps> and Futurama. Perhaps a hard spanking is in order. <clears throat> Too hard! Godzilla was designed by Patrick Totopoulos for both the film and had input on how his look transferred over to animation. Credit for the monsters goes especially to producer and director Aldo Payton and designer Phil Barlow. They would design new monsters together and submit the designs to Reynas for tweaks and final approval. Payton is known for leading the Monster High series and Barlow also designed characters for Extreme Ghostbusters. Roland Emmerich himself was an EP on the show along with his frequent collaborator, Dean Devlin. Devlin wrote the original Stargate film as well as Independence Day and co-wrote the 98 Godzilla flick with Emmerich. As we mentioned earlier, Emmerich directed the 98 film as well as Independence Day, but also The Day After Tomorrow and 2012. A lot of end of the world stuff with this dude. What's going on? Purportedly, Emmerich and Devlin were pretty hands-on in the initial concepting of the show and then let the show staff handle it once it got rolling. Ooh. There were nine total directors on the series. David Hartman, a journeyman animated TV director, directed 20 episodes, by far the most of any one director on the show. He also worked on Jackie Chan Adventures. One more thing. Sam Liu, who directed the second most episodes at seven, would go on to some awesome animation directing work. Batman the Killing Joke, Gotham by Gaslight, Superman Red Sun. I mean, DC trusts this guy with their big animated projects and he kills it every time. If you're watching, Kudos to you, sir. I am loving you! Unsurprisingly, almost all the other directors worked on Jackie Chan Adventures. Oh! I told you! There are 23 credited writers on IMDb. That includes Reynas and Klein as the show developers, and unsurprisingly, they did a lot of the writing work. More than you can imagine. EYDK faves and comics to Kiss TV crossover icons Len Wein and Marv Wolfman each wrote an episode. They've co-created some of comics most beloved characters as we've detailed numerous times on other EYDK episodes. Seriously, go Google these guys and see how many awesome characters they've created. It's insane. There's nothing wrong with a little gratitude. Steven Melching, who wrote three episodes, has written for a lot of Star Wars animated properties like The Clone Wars, Rebels and Resistance. Are you serious? Harry Kluwer, who wrote one episode, also wrote for Star Trek Voyager. <laughs> Scott Lobdell, who also wrote one episode, penned the surprise recent horror hit, Happy Death Day. Huh? Haven't seen it. Collectively, the writers cover a lot of ground as is typical, but there were a ton of writers who also worked on, surprise, surprise, Jackie Chan Adventures and X-Men the Animated Series. Oh dear. There are 78 voice actors credited on IMDb. Jason Priestley from Beverly Hills 90210 fame was originally going to play Nick. He even recorded several episodes before he was replaced by his co-star Ian Ziering. At least they could have hired a real actor. This guy's embarrassing. Purportedly, the Priestley replacement was due to scheduling conflicts. You're kidding me, right? Zeering is, of course, also known for Biker Mice from Mars. Whoa! Imminent destruction! What a rush! And the incomparable sci fi franchise, Sharknado. It's my boy, we co workers. Let's go kill some sharks! Yeah! Reno Romano played Randy Hernandez. Oh, turn it off! He was Batman in 2004's The Batman. Stay down. Not a problem. And Spidey in Spider Man Unlimited. My spider sense is going full blast. That's a pretty dope resume. That's like a dream. To play Batman and Spidey, 
Salute you, sir. Hey, some people are just lucky. Charity James played Elsie Chapman. Are you okay? <sighs> so much for a relaxing bath. She was on Gargoyles. Treacherous human. And was also in Space Jam. <laughs> I'm up for another one. Malcolm Denaire played Mendo Craven. Fastest laser in the West. He also played Mendo Craven in the 98 movie. By the way, Dr. Craven, have you met the worm guy? <laughs> Sorry, <clears throat> summer cold. Brigitte Bako played Monique Dupree. And I'm sure that's what you thought when you selected that outfit, but you were wrong both times. She's also a Gargoyles alum. My love, you know what we must do. Tom Kenny, the voice of SpongeBob. We're gonna open a jar. Easy. Voice Nigel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kevin Dunn voiced Major Hicks. Sorry, Chuck. No time for a round of golf today. You most certainly recognize him as he's been in a ton of movies. Most notably from Transformers, where he plays Shia LaBeouf's dad. No sacrifice, yeah, no, no victory. victory. You know, I got it. Paget Brewster voiced Audrey Timmons. This is Audrey Timmons with an exclusive report from the heart of Monster Island. She was also Bird Girl on Harvey Birdman. And you are... Bird Girl! <laughs> Your trusty legal sidekick. Joe Pantaleano plays Animal Pilati. I could be home enjoying my wife's pasta vasul. No, you dragged me down here to hunt monsters. Joey Pants is an American treasure of a character actor. Memento. You do not know who you are. What you've become since the incident. The Matrix. I mean, if Neo's the one, then there'd have to be some kind of a miracle to stop him. The Sopranos. He told Paulie. Paulie tells Johnny. Telephone game like high school girls. In terms of buried treasure, Godzilla the series doesn't have the deepest bench, but there are definitely a few like Dorian Harewood, Robert Forster, Mae Whitman, Clancy Brown, and Linda Blair. <laughs> now, this is the part of the video where I wish I could tell you about all the awesome toys that were produced to go along with Godzilla the series. But fortunately, life is full of little disappointments. So, that's it? There was a planned line of toys for the show that were going to be produced by Trendmasters, the company that had already produced toys for the 98 film. But the toys for the film sold badly. Evidence as to why is just anecdotal, so take this with a grain of salt. But the fact that the movie had a really murky color palette and was also not quite a film for kids probably didn't help these toys pop on the action figure aisle. <coughs> In any case, Trendmasters canceled the show toys in response to the movie toys bad sales, which is a bummer because we missed out on what would have been some sweet new monster figures and also a planned line of really cool giant size figures. Some photos of these planned giant figures are online and who knows, maybe some of the prototypes made it into the wild. Anyone have one? If you do, let us know in the comments. Maybe I'll offer you money, not my money. In the fight for ultimate Godzilla might, who will rule? Only you can decide. Maybe it's for the best though. Godzilla toys are some of the biggest shoes to fill in the toy world. You know what? I'm just trying to put a silver lining on it. It kind of sucks. I think we just gotta live with the grief. No! Carl's Jr. slash Hardy's did release a small line of toys for the show with their kids meals, but that's all that exists plastic wise to commemorate Godzilla the series. Now, video game wise, this is a different story. There were a bunch of video games related to the 98 film, but the series also got a couple of games of its own, like Godzilla the Series for Game Boy Color and 2000's Godzilla the Series Monster Wars. Wonder why they went handheld with all those, cause a Godzilla game for N64 would have been dope. <laughs> in comics, there was some Godzilla the Series content in a few issues of Totally Fox Kids magazine. But thinking about Godzilla more broadly, there's of course been a ton of media since the animated series. The recent Godzilla film series has spawned a successful monsterverse and has been a lot more popular with kaiju fans than the 98 film. My god, Zilla. And there is so much more when it comes to Godzilla games, comics, movies, and merchandise. In fact, Magic the Gathering had a Godzilla crossover this year for all you tabletop gamers out there. So the king is still stomping away with no signs of stopping like there was ever any doubt. But let's remember that for a chunk of a generation, Godzilla the series was the American intro to the amazing world of kaiju. Kaiju stories both in the Godzilla canon and outside, for example, Pacific Rim, 
have gotten a lot of exposure in the last decade and have become more mainstream on the whole. There's so much amazing history in this genre that's been going strong for decades that pays huge dividends once you discover it. Of course, there are some of us who discovered Godzilla and Kaiju before the series ever came out, but another Godzilla show was welcomed and gave us a whole host of new peeps to share our love for monsters with. What do you guys think? Was Godzilla the series your intro to the world of Kaiju? Do you actually love the 98 movie and think everyone else is out of their mind? Radical ideas always meet resistance from lesser minds. Oh, also, better Godzilla related song, alright? Puffy's Come With Me. I love you daily and not sincerely. Pharaoh Manche, Simon Says. Simon Says, get the f up. Put your hands to the sky. Oh, 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 oh. Or Eminem's Godzilla. Fire, Godzilla, fire. Let me know in the comments. Not again. Thanks for watching. For more EYDK, make sure you click, touch, or do whatever you do over there. And for new episodes I drop every other week, make sure you subscribe over there.